Will the Committee of, uh, Committee of Supply please come to order? This section of the Committee of Supply will now consider the estimates of the Department of Housing, Addictions, and Homelessness. Does the Honourable Minister have an opening statement? I do. The Honourable <laughs> uh, Minister of Housing, Addictions, and Homelessness. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the critic to their role and uh, to the first estimates process. Um, I look forward to working collaboratively and answering some questions today. On behalf of the Department of Housing, Addictions and Homelessness, I'm pleased to present the 2425 financial estimates. I'm incredibly proud of these investments and the supports that we're providing in Budget 24, 2024 to address the challenges Manitobans have faced with regards to housing, homelessness, addictions and mental health. For the first time ever, housing, homelessness, addictions, and mental health have been consolidated into one single department with the purpose to break down barriers as we recognize these issues are connected and multifaceted. Our government knows that many Manitobans are personally touched by these issues. People, families, and communities are hurting. Our government understands this and are committed to doing the right thing by taking action. Much of my work is inspired by personal tragedy. Like others, I have lost family members and loved ones. My father, 22 years ago, and a few months ago, my sister. I know how difficult it is, to, it is in supporting a loved one uh, with addictions. I'm also someone who has lived in social housing, both as a child and also as a young parent. I know how important it is to have affordable housing, truly affordable, rent geared to income, in order to get an education, to get a good job, and live a fulfilling life. One of our department's first actions when we formed government in October 2022, or 2023, was to begin working with community partners to connect with their relatives who were unhoused and, housing with, and house them with wraparound supports to help them on their journey to wellness. I am pleased to share with members around the table that as, that as a result of our work with community agencies over the winter, 91 people were permanently housed and another 157 were temporarily housed. In our first year of government, we have provided capital funding for 392 housing units. 118 of those are rent geared to income and 238 are affordable. These projects are in development or under construction. We look forward to more announcements in the new future, and I am grateful to other levels of government and philanthropic organizations who have partnered with us to bring, these, bring forth these much needed housing projects. Since forming government, our department has also increased funding to community-based programs that meet youth where they are, including the Indigenous Youth Mentorship and the Source of Strength program, as well as funding for Manitoba's five health authorities to strengthen regional suicide prevention networks. In Budget 2024, you will find the Department is focused squarely on its mandate. We are fully committed to ending chronic homelessness in Manitoba in two terms, building more social and affordable housing throughout the province, supporting harm reduction initiatives, and ensuring mental health and addiction services are available and accessible to Manitobans when needed. The department's proposed 2024-25 budget reflects a core expenditure of $673 million, which is an increase of $69 million from the adjusted 2023-2024 budget or an 11.4% increase. The 2024-25 Housing Addictions and Homelessness Summary Budget is set at $794 million. Budget for 2024 delivers the investments needed for our department to act on its mandate and provide wraparound supports to end chronic homelessness, increase safe and affordable housing, implement harm reduction initiatives, and enhance suicide prevention and mental health and addiction services here in our province. We know that ending chronic homelessness in Manitoba has to start with social and affordable housing and supporting folks along their housing and wellness journeys. That is why our government is committed $5 million for the delivery of homelessness support services 
to 285 individuals. These are people exiting homelessness, often who need supports to access housing, readjust to being tenants, and maintain their tenancies. These support services will ensure people exiting homelessness are successful in their new homes and can fully participate in their communities. The department is working to address the homelessness crisis in Manitoba by investing more than $116 million towards building and maintaining social and affordable housing, including $70 million in capital for Manitoba housing and investing to create 350 new units of social and affordable housing. Budget 2024 will provide $20 million for the 2024 capital grant program to increase the social housing supply in Manitoba through partnerships with community housing providers to acquire, renovate, or construct new social housing units. Our new $10 million affordable housing partnership program will work with municipalities and Indigenous governments to facilitate the planning, development, and conversion of buildings of new affordable housing units. Building new social housing is central to our plan to end chronic homelessness over two terms. However, it is equally important to preserve and improve our existing social housing. In addition to the capital funding mentioned earlier, our government has increased repair and maintenance budget for Manitoba housing by $4 million. We have also initiated two pilot projects with the Canadian Mental Health Association to deliver support services to Manitoba housing tenants who are, ex who are exiting homelessness or fleeing gender-based violence. This new partnership is the first step in a long-term plan to establish a housing first model within Manitoba housing. The pilot project projects have successfully housed 25 people exiting homelessness and have seen CMHA support not only their clients, but also other tenants in developing key life skills and facilitating access to health and social services. Our government is taking a strong approach to harm reduction and the addictions crisis by listening to public health experts and individuals with personal experience and working with community organizations and people on the front lines. This approach is sending us in the right direction to connecting Manitobans with the supports that they need. Our government is committing $4 million to deliver on the department's mandate items for addiction support and harm reduction. This includes establishing a supervised consumption site in downtown Winnipeg, providing drug checking machines to reduce the harms associated with an un unregulated toxic drug supply, and expanding the number of detox beds and treatment options for people struggling with addictions. We are supporting the mental health of young people in Manitoba by committing $1 million to deliver a province-wide suicide prevention strategy with a priority focus on Indigenous and 2S LGBTQ plus youth. Budget 2024 is also providing $1.1 million for increased support for existing integrated youth services with the establishment of two new sites, one in, nor one in the north and one in, in, in the south in Manitoba. These commitments will ensure young people have the supports of their peers, schools, families, and communities to thrive. In addition, 500,000 will be provided for the expansion of eating disorders programming and services. The department also remains fully committed to working with the Department of Justice to hire 100 mental health workers to work alongside law enforcement and community organizations. Together, these commitments will ensure Manitobans have access to dignified housing and mental health supports and addiction supports to enjoy a good quality of life and a sense of belonging in their communities right here in Manitoba. I am, ha I am thankful to uh, be in this position and support Manitobans and I look forward to our dialogue this afternoon. Miigwech. We thank the Minister for those comments.
Here's we're having some technical difficulties with broadcast, so we're going to take a very hopefully brief recess while we resolve that. So please don't go anywhere because we have a lot of estimates to get through. <laughs> so do you want to just pause briefly, picture? please? Can Thank you. Will the committee, uh, will the committee please, please resume? Does the critic from the official opposition have an opening statement? The honourable member for Morden Winkler. Okay. Sorry, just one second. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair, and. Uh, Thank you to everybody who's here today. Um, I just want <clears throat> to um, tell, just say how much of an honor it is for me to be here today, to be able to do this job and to uh, represent um, our pro people in our province, uh, people in my community, as well as the rest of, um, of the communities in Manitoba um, on very important issues that are, are close to most of our heart, or all of our hearts, really. Um, I don't think there's very many people that uh, we can, can say that they don't have somebody in their family or their life that is going through difficult times, whether that's addictions or um, affordability and not being able to have that home security or food security. Um, and I think it's really important for us to um, be here today to um, consider um, what we can do as the government or as uh, for me as opposition to to try to do as much as I can to find out information about how things are going in the province and how the government, current government's doing. So I find it, I'm, I'm honored to be able to do this um, on behalf of of um, all of the people that are our folks that are out there um, suffering or dealing with situations with family members and loved ones, uh, whether that be housing, uh, social housing or um, family members who are homeless and they don't have anybody or anywhere to go and they don't know where they are. Um, these are all such big issues as well as mental health as well. Like, um, it's just, there's so much, so much in our province that's, uh, and it's devastating to see some of these situations and, and that I can be here to um, help uh, work together uh, with my uh, with the minister and to uh, do what we can for the province and for the people that we love. So thank you very much. Um, I do have a lot of um, lived experience as well as other, um, other avenues of experience as well with um, affordable housing and with Manitoba housing specifically. I, uh, as the minister mentioned, she's, also, she's, she's had to, she's used those services and, and I can say I've done the same. So it's an important service that we need to make sure we, we protect and we work as hard as we can to make sure we have housing um, and that we take care of our loved ones who are, are struggling with uh, recovery uh, from addictions or um, you know, affordability and mental health. So thank you for having me here today. And I just wanted to say that um, I appreciate being here and being able to work together. Thank you. We thank the member. Under Manitoba practice, debate on the minister's salary is the last item considered for a department in the Committee of Supply. Accordingly, we shall now defer consideration of line item 24.1A contained in resolution 21, 24 rather, point one. At this time, we invite the minister's staff to join us at the table. We ask that the minister introduce the staff in attendance. Please join us. The Honourable Minister. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce my amazing uh, team, my staff that are here to support me today. So I have uh, my Deputy Minister, Catherine Gates. Um, I also have Assistant Deputy Minister, Carolyn Ryan. 
Um, Acting Executive Director Sean Leggett. Acting Executive Director Vicki Taves. Assistant Deputy Minister Brian Melkovich. And then my amazing Director of Ministerial Affairs, Andre Forrest. So I want to thank you all for being here and for supporting. And Brian, oh, sorry, Robert, and also my Assistant Deputy Minister and Executive Financial Officer, Robert King. Thank you. According to our Rule 7816, during the consideration of departmental estimates, questioning for each department shall proceed in a global manner with questions put separately on all resolutions once the official opposition critic indicates that questioning has concluded. The floor is now open for questions. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, my first question uh, is about um, um, affordable housing and, and social housing. Um, can the minister explain the difference between social housing and the affordable units? The social and the affordable units, sorry. The Honourable Minister. I want to thank the member for that question. So affordable would be like social rent geared to income. So based on your income, 30% of your income. Our manageable housing would be a good example of that. So that's why we made the commitment to uh, put more investments into maintaining our manageable housing. As you know, the prior government um, made cuts to that budget by 87%. Um, <coughs> left a lot of those units boarded up, sold off a lot of those um, housing units, which left a lot of people unsheltered um, and put us into a real um, predicament today because there was a lot of units that could have been used today. So those were really, truly rent geared to income. So we've been able to house over 1,500 people. I know I said in the house a couple of weeks ago that it was 1,200, but it's now 1,500 people we've been able to house since we've come into government uh, since November, actually. So we're really proud of that um, because these are folks that would otherwise be homeless or they're um, um, exposed to gender-based violence. Um, these are folks that are coming out of care, um, kids that are, you know, exiting the child welfare system. And really we've made it um, 
a mandate of ours to, as you know, in the next two terms to end chronic homelessness. So we've really focused on our own housing, but also we also have an EIA shelter uh, benefit, and that's uh, to provide a benefit to folks so that they can access um, non-Manitoba housing. So if they want to go into the private market or if they go into a non-profit housing, there's a shelter benefit to them as well. So a lot of non-profits will provide um, social affordable housing. So if you go into the private market, let's say a two-bedroom is like $1,600, that's market value rent. So that's not social and affordable. So what's affordable to me isn't affordable to someone that's living in a tent or someone that's on EIA. Um, when we look at affordable or rent geared to income in, um, in Manitoba housing, we really look at your income and it's 30% based on that. So there's a mix that's operated. So there's government run, which is run by us. So which is the um, Manitoba housing. And then we have nonprofits and there's several of them. We've also provided um, some funds to those groups to be able to um, maintain um, rents at the rates that they're providing to um, the tenants. As we know, under the former government, there was a, a building, Lyons Manor, that was sold off, and um, many folks were at risk of losing their tenancy, and that was a nonprofit. Um, and we want to ensure that um, these buildings that are supporting folks in our province at um, affordable rent geared to income with some shelter benefits or rent supplements um, are able to maintain that level of, um, of, of rent, of amount, because if they go into the, if they sell off that building, those folks will be um, unable to afford market rent and then they'll be displaced. And often that's their community in those buildings. So that's why we've been able to provide that. We've heard loud and clear from nonprofits that they need extra <coughs> funding to be able to continue to operate as nonprofits and provide um, that level of support to tenants. We also have the private market, which I've talked about a bit. So rent assist. Um, will kick in to a certain percentage where people can um, get a benefit that'll top up their rent so that they're able to um, pay higher rents in those um, units. And yeah, we've been able to house about 1,500 people and we're very happy about that and we're continuing to move that needle in terms of maintaining and uh, supporting people here in Manitoba. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler. Thank you uh, very much for that uh, question, answer that question. Um, I just wanted to just bring a, uh, a question about uh, in December the Minister paused uh, the sale of 19 public housing properties. Um, can she provide a list of the Manitoba housing properties uh, these were? And just to bring a little uh, information out, I'm, I am aware that there are some um, Manitoba housing units that are sitting empty currently and um, I'm just wondering if the minister is aware that um, right now they're sitting empty and they're in need of repair, and there are private investors who are waiting to uh, purchase those like those um, properties, and that they're they're asked, being asked to sign and willingly sign an agreement that they will continue with the low income housing uh, amounts for people for the people who will be moving into those spaces for up to 18 years to like after they've purchased and invested in in uh, fixing up these properties so i i don't see how that's not just a win-win for everybody rather than having these properties sitting empty um, they're willing to come in and and do the renovations and uh and sign a, uh, an agreement that they will continue the the low income Manitoba housing um, amounts that people will be are, are paying through the program.
The Honourable Minister. So, as the member will know, um, under the previous government, there were a lot of sales that happened of, of social housing. And 185 Smith is one example of one sale that was over 300 units. This, um, you know, today would have given over 300 people access to housing. There's currently um, a need for that in our province. And under the former government, there were even more sales. And when I was, um, you know, blessed in this position, one of the first things I looked at is we needed to secure this crown jewel and ensure that we had access for folks here in Manitoba to good quality, affordable, safe housing. And the only way we could do that is by ensuring that we as uh, Manitoba housing providers could provide that as an asset in-house. Under the former government, there was a 20% um, change in management. So 20% were either sold off or um, management was changed. So went into the hands of someone else to manage, which really tied our hands as government in terms of who could access that housing. So if we wanted someone, for instance, that was in an encampment today to get into one of those units because it was vacant, we couldn't just go to that housing provider because it's not managed by us and say to them, we need that suite today for someone who needs housing. Um, we've taken a different, direct, different uh, direction as a government. We've looked at Manitoba housing as a responsibility as a government to provide housing for Manitobans that's truly rent geared to income, and that is affordable, that is safe, that is quality, and that provides and meets people's needs where they're at. Um, in 2017, there was 46 million that was invested by the previous government. 2018-19, it went down to 25 million. 2019-20, 36 million. 2020-21, 31 million. 2021, 37 million. And then when you look at what our government's investing today, we're at 77 million. So you can see the difference in investments and in how we take um, the responsibility <coughs> and, and the issue and this um, as a sacred responsibility of housing people. Not only that, but as Manitoba housing is a crown jewel of investing not only in housing people, but also in the staff, the folks that are working on the front lines in, in supporting these folks. I was fortunate enough to go to um, Dauphin, um, to Brandon, to um, Portage de Prairie, um, all over the province to many of our housing, Manitoba housing uh, uh, units, and meet so many amazing um, frontline staff that are working to ensure that, you know, our most vulnerable folks um, are staying tenanted, successfully tenanted. And that's not always easy because we know that. Um, you know, this, the landscape in Manitoba has changed, that the way that we house people and the supports that they need have changed in this province. And I just, you know, I want to uplift and, and, you know, I can't say enough about the amazing work that our Manitoba housing staff are doing on the front lines because they are doing incredible work um, with what they had. Um, we've continued to staff up and, and provide more supports because we've been listening to them, we've heard them, and we know that they need more supports um, in order to continue to keep people successfully housed in, in the units. The Honourable Member for Morden and Clare. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, <clears throat> that information. Um, I, I just want to say that it, it's it's um, 
it's unfortunate that for many, many years, the crown jewel, as the, as the minister referred to, um, was ignored by the NDP government and it fell in disarray. And, I, and I'm sorry that that happened because now it falls on everybody in, like in the last, you know, now in the current government and our government in the past that um, the repairs have to be done and it's, it's overwhelming, uh, I'm sure. Um, but <clears throat> um, can the minister um, just uh, exp uh, let me know if she has a breakdown of the 1,500 um, that have been housed that she mentioned earlier? Um, can she give me a breakdown where those are, where those housing or where they've been, where they're currently being housed now that um, in those spaces? The Honourable Minister. So I don't have the update on the 1500, but I can give uh, the member an update on the 1200 that I referenced in the House. Um, so again, I want to uplift and, um, you know, just send my gratitude and, you know, the gratitude from our government out to all of those housing um, first organizations, all of those um, folks that are on the front lines that are working to support all of these folks and getting them housed. Because it takes a tremendous amount of work um, to not only support these folks in, in getting them housed, but also to continue to support their tenancy. Um, these are you know, folks that are case managers. These are folks that work at um, organizations like women's centers and homelessness Winnipeg um, in shelters um, and so many other places um, across our province whether it's in um, Brandon or Thompson or um, Portage de Prairie like all over our province there's great work being done by so many um, organizations and I just want to uplift and just say, you know, we're, we are very grateful for the work that they're doing because without the work that they're doing, we can't do the work that we're doing. So I just want to um, say that first of all. So um, in November to October, there were 141 that were um, discharged from hospital. Um, there were 126 that were um, coming out of um, domestically violent relationships. Um, 811 of them were um, homeless. And then from November to October, um, 77 were um, from the hospital. Uh, 120 of them were gender-based violence. 725 of them were from um, the shelter. And these, again, were 125 of them were from our Housing First teams. 32 of them were uh, provided rent supplements. 129 of them came out of our uh, winter response. Uh, the member would have remembered, uh, would recall that we brought together a table of um, uh, folks from organizations who had been working on the front lines with folks um, that were unsheltered such as Mama We, um, uh, Salome Mission, um, different organizations, folks from Brandon came and we, we came up with a, um, a preventative strategy to house people in the winter and really looking at long-term housing and making sure that people had supports throughout so not just you know putting people in shelters that's a short term right but looking at longitudinally how do we ensure that people stay tenanted with the wraparound supports because we know that we can't just put people in homes all too often you know as the mla for point douglas the three shelters are in my riding i would go time and time again to the shelter and you know i'd see those same faces and too often they'd say to me I'd see that face again, they'd be housed, and I'd say, why are you back? 
they weren't getting the supports that they needed. So this department was created because of that, because we recognize and we are committed to providing quality, safe, affordable um, housing with supports that are going to help um, keep people tenanted. You know, whether it's mental health supports, we know that there's, um, you know, folks that whether they have brain injuries or, you know, everyone struggles with mental health, right? And um, I don't think any person in this province is immune to, you know, struggling and at some point needs some kind of support. So we've, you know, enhanced our ACT, FACT and um, PAC teams or ACT and FACT teams to provide supports to 300 more Manitobans in this province um, and you know we're just continuing to support and meet folks where they're at and this is um, in support of that and 725 of these folks actually were housed within Manitoba housing units so again you know working on maintaining uh, turning around units and investing in our own crown jewel has made a real impact and a real difference. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler. Yeah, I'm just going to um, let my, my colleague here ask a question really quick. Which colleague? Um, member from... Hey, so, the, the member for Dawson Trail. Okay, I'm more going to back up two answers just because I heard something in your answer that I kind of tweaked the question in my brain. Um, you were saying that when there's housing units available, as government, we're now kind of saying who goes into those. Are we considering the safety of the other residents within those facilities already? Because I recall back, I think it was even under our time, so it's not really a partisan thing. Um, there was a murder of some kind that had occurred from a tenant that had not been evicted from a, a housing unit. And I also know of a single mother a number of years back who was saying that she was in one of these Manitoba housing units and the safety was, it was out of control because she could not, she almost wished that more single mothers had been placed together. So that's, I, just going back to that initial saying that we're just plopping people there or, or whatever, it's a little bit concerning to me. I don't know if I just misheard it or if it's something that, you know, is just needing further review. It's not a, not a shot, just, it just tweaked something with me there. The Honourable Minister. So I just want to um, 
disabused member of the language that they used around plopping people into housing because we just don't plop people into housing. We ensure that, you know, we're meeting people where they're at and we're providing housing based on what their needs are. That's something that I'm very proud of our team in terms of restructuring the way that we're doing housing because that was very evident under the previous government in terms of selling off, um, you know, not providing the supports that were needed in the buildings that, um, you know, provide that we're really getting unsafe. And when, you know, our government, when we took government, we heard that loud and clear from, you know, the, the coordinators, from the managers that, you know, they were understaffed, um, they didn't have the supports that they needed, that they weren't feeling safe um, in the jobs that they were doing. and. We were able to hire um, 10 tenant service coordinators, four program managers. We're working on hiring two Indigenous spiritual care um, workers to really um, support and bring together a team of people that are really um, working on meeting people where they're at. Um, so what happens is um, in order for tenants to come into Manitoba housing, they have to, it's income tested. So again, they have to qualify. And then they, do, they go through an interview where they're assessed based on their needs. Um, and I just want to uplift Brian, because Brian works a lot on our housing uh, team. And everyone knows Brian by his name. I met with a lot of our tenants, and they speak highly of the work that he does. And, um, and all of our you know, tenant coordinators and any building you walk into, they, they know them by name because they have a relationship with them. And so it doesn't always work. It's not a perfect system. Um, but we've, we've identified, you know, areas where we need to improve and we've put in um, improvements in those places. Um, we also have four new mobile security officers so that are able to respond when there's uh, a need. Um, and again, um, these tenant coordinators are there so that we're not having to have mobile security, so that the relationships are being built, so that proactive work is being done, and um, you know, fires are put out before they happen. Right? And people, if people need extra supports, then we were able to find them extra supports. And many of the folks that are living in some of the Manitoba housing units will have case managers or be working with organizations who also work with our Manitoba housing um, staff. So if there is an issue, they will call them and let them know and they will come and work with them. So it's not like, you know, we're like a, you know, finger waving, but it's like, how do we work collaboratively together to work together for the best needs of the tenant to make sure that they're supported and that they stay successfully <coughs> tenanted? Because, um, you know, as you will know, life happens, right? Sometimes something happens in your life where there's a crisis and, you know, you just need that extra support. So I'm, you know, we have a couple of pilot projects that I'm super proud of, um, one in Dauphin and one at 44 Kennedy. And if you're around on Friday, they're unveiling the mural that's um, on the side of that building. So if you're around to go and see that mural, it's gonna be a very beautiful mural. But CMHC is in there, so Canadian Mental Health Association. And prior to um, us, re um, coming into government, um, 10 different workers were coming in to support 10 different people. And, um, you know, our brilliant staff, Carolyn here, identified that and said, you know, we have 10 different workers coming in to te support 10 different people. We should do a pilot where we, you know, have everyone supported in this building that needs support. Why don't we take, take these 10 workers and create a model where we can support everyone in this building that wants to have support? So we converted some of this building so that everyone can come and get support from a team of, of workers. And it's worked really well. And we've done the same thing in Dauphin. So, um, you know, the, the level of support that people are receiving in Manitoba housing has really increased and people are really um, staying successfully tenanted. 
a reminder uh, that putting questions and answers uh, must happen through the chair, just for all members. Thank you. The member for Dawson Trail. Okay, so just a bit of a follow up. It was not intended to imply we're just blocking people. It just was the language I came to mind at that time. Um, so in these situations, I, I've heard we're talking to a lot of caseworkers, all of that, but we're not necessarily, are we talking to the tenants themselves and, and advising, like getting their advice? Um, this may be a separate question, but it's just something that also came to my attention was regarding the bed bug problem. And I know it's a huge problem, problem within Manitoba housing. And there have been organizations that have also um, suggested different ways of dealing with the bed bugs. And I'd be more than willing to talk with the minister outside of this about that. Um, but it's just, these are the concerns. And I'm just wondering, are we talking regularly with the tenants in each building? The Honourable Minister. So um, our tenant service coordinators are heavily involved with the tenants. Um, our, um, our staff just did a tour and actually met with residents. I went on a couple of the tours and actually met with residents, heard their concerns, um, and that was why we hired more staff and more service providers on the front lines to support folks. Um, we, in, in, in all regions of the province, when it comes to pest management, um, we hired, we're a, we hired more people to support because when I was in opposition, I heard people were getting evicted because they couldn't move their belongings. And so they would get evicted for manageable housing for not being able to move their belongings. So there's been someone hired, there's been money invested so that that service could be provided. So if a senior, let's say, needs that service, sorry, I'm just, or if, you know, someone that's struggling with mental health issues, doesn't want someone come into their suite, you know, you have someone that can come in and provide support to that person to be able to help them manage someone coming into their suite. There's a lot more services um, today than there was 
you know, prior. Um, there, the bed bugs, um, it's actually 50% lower than it was in 2015. So we've seen a, a significant decrease across the province in terms of bed bugs. So that's a good news story. And again, I want to uplift and, you know, say, um, I can't say enough about the people who are working on the front lines to help and support the tenants and to make sure that, you know, those um, bed bug um, sprays are being done because I know it's annoying when you have to move your furniture every month for someone to come in and spray. <coughs> but once it's done and, you know, there's no more bed bugs in your apartment and in your building, then you're kind of bed bug free. But it is an annoyance to be able to have to always continually do that. So. I just want to say, you know, to those tenants that have had to do that, um, it's annoyance, but at the end, you know, you have a bug-free um, apartment or unit. And um, again, we've invested more supports for people to be able to um, have some with mobility issues or any other issues to be able to have that support to be able to do that. Um, the other thing that we've we've um, ensured that we're doing is making sure that folks have an avenue to um, provide feedback. So again, our tenant service coordinators are that conduit. So we also have some case managers that work on the front line. So like I said, they might have a case manager from a shelter. They might have a case manager from, um, let's say, a women's center, West Central Women's Center that they worked with, or another organization that provides um, support for End Homelessness Winnipeg is another one. And they continue to support them no matter where they live and where they've moved to. And they work really collaboratively with our housing team. And we look at it as like a team approach. So it's not like this is one organization over here and Winnipeg Housing is, or Manitoba Housing is over here. But we look at is how do we look work collaboratively to support this individual, and what do they what are their needs, and um, how do we work collaboratively? And it's really been amazing um, how we've been able to do that. Like I say, Brian has been amazing. Carolyn, really the whole team in terms of providing those wraparound supports to keep people tenanted. Um, you know, our biggest challenge here in the province right now is building more housing. That's our pro that's our, our issue, right? Under, you know, the previous government, there was a lot of housing that was sold off. So now we're, you know, having to play catch up and really work on getting more housing built, work on maintaining um, the housing that we have because it was left unmaintained. So now we're looking at, you know, we did an audit, what could be you know, fixed in a 30, 60, 90, and get those units turned around quickly. I did a, a walkthrough of some of the units, and, you know, Brian showed me what a unit would take to, to get turned around and how long that would take. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler. Um, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Going back to the question about security for the Manitoba housing units, um, just a little more... Um, information or details on that um, we know that you know Manitoba housing um, yes they you guys do like you do a great job on on taking care of their tenants and meeting the needs that they have and I and um, um, it's just something we can't replace there's just it's such an important thing to have that housing for for um, everyone who needs it in our communities um, and I've experienced it myself personally so it's important um, what, a, what an important job that um, everybody does, and it's so much appreciated. Um, which goes back to, um, again, um, you just the minister just mentioned that um, there were four um, mobile uh, officers, security officers um, hired, or in that position, and I'm just wondering how four, um, how how do they cover all of the Manitoba housing units, and uh, specifically if. There's a Manitoba housing unit who has tenants who are scared for their safety, and not because of who's living in the building with them, but more who's coming into the building to other apartments. 
uh, whether there's you know people doing illegal practices or things inside these buildings or these apartments, um, and there's somebody who has a disability living next door who can't really defend themselves, for example, because many people with disabilities live in mantle housing units, uh, people with mental health issues, like you said, um, seniors. So how do we take? How is are those tenants being taken care of when there's only four mobile officers, and how do they? Who, who, who's the intake worker? Who decides where those four officers go to, to meet the needs of those tenants that are needing safety, that have safety concerns? The Honorable Minister. So um, when I referenced the four new security officers, I those are in addition to um, our 36.9 FTEs that we already have. Um, and those four new mobile security officers are going to be stationed um, solely in Central Park because over half our calls were um, dispatched to Central Park. So this is going to be a team dedicated just to Central Park so we can free up um, the rest of um, the mobile um, team to be able to, security officers to be able to go and um, work in other um, buildings as needed with other tenants. So 
they provide uh, security services that improve the safety and well-being of tenants and employees and that's a key priority of our government so Manitoba housing when we took um, government that was something that we committed to we wanted to ensure that we provided safe affordable housing for Manitobans and that's why we added more security officers but we also added like I said more tenants um, service coordinators um, to be able to support uh, Manitobans. Manitoba Housing has more than 300 or 3,000 security cameras in service at 77 properties throughout the province. Um, the Housing Communication Centre operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. And the call centre um, is in Winnipeg and there's a number that tenants call and then they dispatch um, the security officers out to wherever they're needed. Um, so I said that we added those four additional um, mobile security officers to our workforce. And again, um, Central Park concentrated. We also um, partnered with cadets in Brandon. So in Princess Towers, so we had an empty space um, that wasn't being utilized and we saw an opportunity to um, have a collaborative um, partnership with the cadets and for them to build some um, community relationships with the folks that were living in our Manitoba housing building. But there's also a park there. Um, our safe and warm shelter was right across the street. A lot of folks hang out around that area. So we really wanted to um, support and build um, collaboration amongst um, all of us that were um, in that area. So that's really um, been a success. Um, they have a good relationship with the folks that are in, living in the, the building. Uh, the folks that are living in the building have uh, sung praises about um, the value that they brought to the building, but also the folks that are living in and around um, that, that building, and even folks who are unsheltered that live in and around that building. The relationship that they've built with those cadets that are housed in that, uh, that one uh, space within our Princess Towers. Um, since 20, or 2017-18, 67 frontline positions um, were cut in housing and that included security staff. So we, we're taking a different approach, as I said. We wanna continue to support, listen to tenants and meet them where they're at. And that includes, you know, when we hear Central Park needs more support, um, adding those mobile security officers being able to set up a command post there with a bunch of cameras. And again, it's about meeting people where they're at, supporting them, keeping them successfully tenanted. And sometimes people just need, um, you know, I know the member had talked about um, people feeling unsafe and we want people to feel safe in our, our Manitoba housing units. And that's why we're investing more in security and more in tenant services to provide that level of safety and security and keeping Manitoba housing as our crown jewel and continuing to um, invest so that people can have a, a place to live. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler. Okay, thank you uh, to the Minister for that. Um, can the Minister, um, I know that the Minister alluded to this already earlier in her uh, opening statement, um, but can she, or can the Minister please update us on how many mental health workers have been hired to go alongside um, law enforcement agencies at this time, um, but break that down into rural and how many in uh, the city?
The Honourable Minister. So I was just up in Thompson um, last weekend, and I was um, so blessed to be up there for um, Kim's announcement where um, they were rolling out their mobile outreach van, which is serving five communities plus the town of Thompson. Um, I got to meet six of the workers, so there's six in Thompson that have been hired, and um, they're hiring more. And I got to listen to five folks that have already been impacted by the experience of these folks that are um, providing services. So they're providing primary health care and they're providing harm reduction. And these were folks that were um, unhoused mainly, but they talked about um, how they had never well, one participant talked about how they had not accessed any health care at all. And that when they received health care from this mobile unit, how caring, compassionate, and non judgmental um, the care that they received was. There was another um, individual that talked about. Um, meeting them where they were at and not, um, you know, judging them and providing, um, you know, health care because they had gone to the hospital and they, they felt that they were judged and they didn't feel like that they, they didn't feel that they got the level of care that they should have uh, been given at the hospital. Um, another participant talked about um, spreading the word about the services that this mobile outreach um, service was providing. And again, like this is um, one service that's going to provide services to five communities plus the town of Thompson that is mobile, um, coming and providing services to the community where they're at. Um, and, you know, just to meet the folks that were providing the care, there was six, um, they were all First Nations. Uh, they were all women, is the other thing. Um, and when they talked about, you know, the care, there was one that just talked um, the care that they're providing and why they're providing it. And it's to connect people with care, long-term care, right? People that may have an illness that don't even know about it, right? And that prevention piece and how do you um, help people connect to healthcare in a, in a relational way, in a trusting way, in a way that um, is going to have a warm handoff at the, at the hospital so that they can, you know, get further treatment if they need it. Um, another one talked about, you know, the harm reduction and receiving <coughs> care from that mobile unit. And they also connect people with services beyond that. So if they want to get into treatment, if they want to get into detox, you know, if they're wanting to, you know, um, get other services, that that is their one connection that they can get. So I just want to, um, you know, again, uplift and honor the work that's being done in Thompson um, in the Kim Mobile um, outreach van as well because they're doing phenomenal work in their well variety center, um, in this mobile outreach, and in so many other um, programs in Thompson as well. We also have our fact and act teams. As you know, we made an announcement a few weeks ago, and, and that's really to support people and meet them where they're at and help them um, live in the community. So these are folks that would otherwise be hospitalized um, and it's a continuum of care. So, you know, if you need more levels of care, um, you know, you would be with the ACT team. The less level of care you need, you go down to the FACT team. Correct. Okay. And then you can, you know, if, if you find yourself in crisis and you need more support, you can go back up to the FACT. Like, it's, it's a continuum of care. And it's to ensure that people are successfully supported in living in the community. And these are folks that would be 
um, incarcerated, that would be living in encampments, that would be otherwise in the hospital because of mental illness. So again, these are folks, and then we have more, but I'll get to that in the next or something. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, yes, like the ACT uh, evidence-based uh, service delivery model that, that's happening. I just want to do a quick shout out to the mental health workers and um, everybody who's been doing this. There's a pilot project that's been going on at, at Eden Mental Health in uh, Winkler, Steinbeck, and Winnipeg. And, and just the job that they're doing is such an amazing job for them. So thank you for setting um, setting us all on the right path um, for to get that going and to have um, that model so that we can use that and, and we can service and take care of those that we need to take care of with mental health. So shout out to, to that organization for setting the way for all of us. Um, and I just want to, uh, again, ask, uh, I guess, of those hundred uh, um, that you talked about, the, the, the added uh, support for the police services, how many of those have been hired and where, if there, how many are in rural and how many are in the uh, city specifically, if, if I could get that information as well. The Honourable Minister. So the ACT and FACT teams, um, there's 22 workers um, that will be hired. Um, we have a crisis and consultation staff for youth. Um, six have been hired of 13. And again, these are to support youth. Um, we recognize and heard um, from so many um, community organizations that were youth serving that there was a need for more services. That um, you know, often these were underrepresented, underserviced, and our team, um, you know, started immediately um, looking at how do we put more supports into the system to support and meet youth where they're at. Um, so I'm very, you know, proud that they were able to to support that. Um, we are working on. Um, cross collaboration across departments so we're working with families and justice so I'm really proud of our government and being able to not just work in silos within our own departments but to work across departments you know we have an amazing DM that uh, Catherine Gates here that and many other um, DMs that have a DMs table that work around um, looking at how do we work collaboratively together around common um, common spaces, you know, whether it's youth in care, whether it's, um, you know, kids that are exiting the justice system or kids that are exiting um, the child welfare system that need housing or folks that are coming out of uh, incarceration that need housing um, or folks that are coming out of the hospitals when we're working with uh, seniors and or um, Minister Asaguera, you know, how do we um, support and housing folks as well? So we're working cross departmentally on so many different um, levels, which I think, you know, really alleviates some of the pressures in so many areas because we have so many hands on deck that are doing such phenomenal work in identifying gaps that maybe our department isn't able to, you know, pick up, but another department is able to. And then collaboratively, we work together to support and enhance services and deliver those services for Manitobans. Um, I think about DCSP. I was just last week during our break week, went for a visit and um, <coughs> we got to see their dashboard and talk with some of the frontline um, workers. I got to meet with their core team, which is their team that uh, works with um, housing folks. They have a um, a group of six and they work primarily with people who are in encampments that need supports in terms of getting housing and just the level of support that they provide the the level of compassion caring and meeting people where they're at when I was talking to them about encampments I asked you know how many people were living there um, and you know the the relationships that they build with these folks and the understanding that this is their home until they find a home was like, and that really, it really struck my heart because I was like, 
this is their home until they find a home, unfortunately, right? And we don't want people living in in those undignified ways. So we really need to build housing and that like we're working on that um, and supporting and meeting people where they're at. Listening to, you know, some of those folks talk about um, getting folks housed and, and how, you know, under the previous government, they really felt like there was nowhere for these folks to go, taking them to shelters and there not being any shelter space because like they were being turned away. And, you know, we really want to work on a long-term solution, which is building housing, um, working on getting our own housing maintained and fixed up and supporting nonprofit housing so that it stays nonprofit, but also building in um, the support. So, you know, I think about Aboriginal Health and Wellness and their mobile clinic. That's another support that's out there and, and supporting the community and going and meeting people where they're at. They're also in vis visiting encampments and supporting and providing um, uh, primary health care in, in places and spaces where people aren't um, getting out to receive those levels of care. So I want to just, you know, uplift and honor all of those folks that are on the front lines providing so much support to to so many of our, our vulnerable folks that need um, so much care and so much love and so much unconditional uh, support. Uh, before moving on, I just want to remind all members uh, that in the Committee of Supply, we need to refer to members by their portfolios or constituencies. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to go on to the topic of um, um, uh, addiction and recovery uh, for a minute here before we're, we're almost done. It seems like this day has just flown by here. Um, just, just knowing how important it is for us to um, to be able to um, provide care and, and support for those that have mental health. And struggling with homelessness, and, and a lot of those things are connected, um, and with the addictions. And just talking about the addictions um, part of this is that just to just to kind of bring a light to um, how we need to support those that are are we that are here and we love, and that um, we want to have them in recovery so that they can have a future and a life and 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 experience and stay with us for for years to come. And so um, me having experienced specifically uh, with some loved ones in my life as well that are you know in recovery and I can't imagine what it would be like not having them in my life and not having them here to celebrate birthdays and to do all the wonderful things that we can do together as a family um, because they were able to you know access recovery and uh, so one of the questions I have is just um, with opiate antagonist uh, Agonist treatment, OAT, is what we, OAT. Um, it's a safe and, and effective uh, treatment used uh, for opioid uh, use disorders. Um, these prescribed medications provide stable, uh, long-acting relief for withdrawal and cravings and can improve um, your health outcomes to help um, give that extra help to um, those that are trying to break free from their addictions. Um, and I think it's up to us to do whatever we can to make sure that we can, you know, help them um, achieve those goals. Um, how many individuals in Manitoba are currently um, using the OAT for their recovery, uh, specifically? How, how much? What does that program look like?
The Honorable Minister. <coughs> so since um, the inception of OAT, there's been over 30,000 service episodes. Um, folks can access um, OAT through their primary health care provider now, so we don't have a line of sight on that. Um, but I can tell you in 2019, there were 67 um, prescribers. Um, to date, there's over 250. Um, so moving towards a more integrated model, um, less stigma around it, um, rather than going to um, a RAM clinic. We also opened up um, RAM digital front door um, a few weeks ago, which is accessible wherever you're at, so you don't have to go wait at a RAM clinic to see a physician. You can see them virtually, and then if you need to go in, they will let you know where to go in. Um, there's seven RAM clinics, so there's three in Winnipeg, one in Brandon, one in Selkirk, one in Thompson, one in Portage. Um, And then across the province, there's anywhere between 117 to 142 people presenting each week. But with the digital front door, that's increased access to a lot more people being able to access it wherever they're at, if they're in the north, um, if they don't have um, you know, a cell phone or internet, they can go to you know, a band office or a community center, wherever they can get um, internet so a lot of folks are doing that or going to um, a community center so we've heard a lot of that when i was at the ram clinic in uh, portage i went to portage during the break and i got to visit their ram clinic um, they talked about the digital front door and how it's changed and how much access it's provided to other folks in that area um, i met with the the team out there and uh, such an amazing team Again, you know, I can't say enough about our service providers right across this province, providing such um, quality, um, compassionate care, um, meeting folks where they're at from a non-judgmental place. And, you know, whether people are ready to, you know, move into treatment or not, um, you know, they, they are accepting and, and supportive. They had a community garden outside of their RAM clinic. Um, they had flowers along the top. It's inaccessible, so they have a wheelchair ramp. They had um, uh, potted plants along the top there. And their team was just so amazing. Um, just the, the level of care. I could feel the love that they, they put into the design. It's an old house, so if you ever get a chance to go visit it. Um, uh, it's, it was just a, you could feel like the love when you went inside. Um, and they had, they had balloons on the wall. That was, that was kind of the heartbreaking part because the balloon represented someone that had lost their life to an overdose. And some of the names were on there twice or three times, but the participants who, or the folks that accessed their services, when they came in, they were able to put that person's name up on that wall. So even though that person's name is already up there, that person was known and loved by many people. So you could see that up on that wall. Um, yeah, it was just a beautiful converted house and um, just the level of services that they provide. And again, digital RAM services, you know, has opened that door to a lot more people being able to access those services and get the care and, and uh, support that they need where they need it and meet them where they're at. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler. Um, thank you uh, for that information. Um, we just we know how important it is for us to um, be sensitive and, and open to hearing what people need and, and to meeting those needs um, in addiction, recovery, housing, um, homelessness, um, mental health especially. Uh, just we know that there's been such a, a large increase in mental health needs and just making sure that um, 
those needs are met and we have services across the whole province in rural Manitoba as well as Winnipeg. Um, so important for us to do um, to meet those needs of, of everyone because we love everybody and, and like you said there's this or like the minister said um, there's a stigma out there um, and people are are um, afraid to <clears throat> to get help and to look for help so um, we just need to let you know that you know you are loved and uh, we are here for you to, to help you and, and in whatever way we can. Um, and that's what I take what I'm doing very seriously as well is just meeting the needs and, and advocating for whatever I can possibly do for our, those in our province and our, and our loved ones. So um, just thank you to everybody who does work with, with our community and our loved ones uh, meeting those needs. It's such a valuable and in, in irreplaceable job that you do. Um, unfortunately, I have, I have many more questions, but I don't think I have any more time to ask my questions. So I want to just say thank you and appreciate um, being able to come here today and ask questions. And um, hopefully there's an open door where I can continually ask questions because I, I really think this is such an important, all of these uh, portfolios of mental health, addictions, homelessness, um, housing are all so important. And uh, I will continue to work hard on that for my constituents and for the people in our province. So thank you very much. So I have no further questions at this time. Seeing no further questions at this time, Resolution 24.2, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $46,586,000 for housing, addictions, and homelessness, mental health and addiction service planning and policy for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2025. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. <coughs> Resolution 24.3, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $239,234,000 for housing addictions and homelessness housing for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2025. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 24.4. Resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $83,881,000 for housing, addictions, and homelessness, physician services, psychiatry for the physical year, fiscal year rather, ending March 31, 2025. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Thanks for more enthusiasm on that. Reso resolution 24.5. Resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $300,848,000 for housing, addictions, and homelessness funding to health authorities for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2025. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 24.6, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $820,000 for housing addictions and homelessness costs related to capital assets of other reporting entities for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2025. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 24.7, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $15 million for housing, addictions, and homelessness loans and guarantees program for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2025. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 24.8, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $77 million $871,000 for housing, addictions, and homelessness, other reporting entities, capital investment for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2025. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. The last item to be considered for the estimates of this department is item 24.1A, the minister's salary contained in resolution 24.1. At this point, we respectfully uh, request the minister's staff to leave the table for the consideration of this last item.
The floor is open for questions. Seeing no questions. I'll put the question for the final resolution, 24.1. Resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $1,840,000 for housing, addictions, and homelessness, administration, and finance for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2025. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. This completes the estimates for the Department of Housing, Addictions, and Homelessness. The next set of estimates to be considered by this section of the Committee of Supply for the, is for the estimates of agriculture. The hour being 4.55, what is the will of the committee? Committee rise.